Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna take a look at this. It's an NEC APC, or Advanced Personal Computer. Believe it or not, this thing, which has dual eight inch disk drives, is actually an 8086 PC that runs MS-DOS and CPM86. At the time that this computer came out, the dominance of the IBM PC wasn't firmly established yet, so other companies like NEC decided to go their own way and come up with a similar PC that wasn't actually compatible. Now, I don't actually know if this machine works at all. I have no idea of the condition of it other than the way it visually looks. I do have some operating system disks for it, so if it does work, hopefully we can get it actually booted up. But I think for this video, let's first take a look at this computer and then we'll open it up, take a look inside, and then see if it actually powers up. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, the APC, it's a relatively large computer. It's similar in size to the TRS-80 Model 2, although it's probably, I think it's a little bit more compact than that machine, even though it's got double disk drives. But we have to remember that this came out, well, I'm not sure what year exactly it came out in, but I think it was 1983, or that's at least when this one was made. And therefore we had half height eight inch disk drives by that point, and the Model 2 has a full height disk drive right there. I'm assuming that the yellowish color that this thing has is due to yellowing of the plastic. And if we take a look at the keyboard here, the space bar, which I guess is PBT, has not yellowed, but the rest of the keys have. So probably the entire machine would have been this beige color originally. As you can see with the keyboard here, the layout is definitely non-standard and doesn't follow anything like the PC. But of course, the Model F was the only keyboard that was out at that point for the IBM PC. And this machine did not set out to be a clone of the IBM, so they kind of went their own way. But there is the layout, and there's a little bit of a ring when you push the keys. I'm, I'm guessing that these are Alps key switches, which is a good thing. That means it's not foam and foil. Let's take a closer look at some of these keys here. There's graph one and graph two. Caps lock is up there next to the control. There's a function key up here, and then unlabeled function key row which almost certainly would have gone with some kind of template that slid in right here on the keyboard on both sides. So I guess you switched it out for whichever application you were running. The layout of the letters and the enter key and stuff like that is pretty standard. So I'm gonna think that typing on this, if you're used to a PC layout, like a current keyboard, is gonna be relatively easy to use, other than maybe the control and the caps lock being right there. I do like how chunky the font is. It's just, it's kind of extra chunky. And then over here we have the arrow keys and the numeric keypad. So these are arranged in a slightly unusual way, but pretty easy if you're trying to play a game. Not that there's any games on this computer. We have an insert and delete key, clear home, print key, and then a break stop key. And that's a large one there, you know, so you can hit that quickly and stop your application. The keyboard has a very thick fixed cable. It's fixed on this side and it does disconnect from the back of the computer. It has like a Centronics looking connector. So there it is, the APC-H25 keyboard. There's a serial number and it is made in Japan. And there's another sticker there with a spec number, whatever that is. The only other interesting thing is this right here. And it looks like it's maybe a rubber bumper to hit the underside of the computer. But I think this is some kind of a plug actually, but it doesn't really want to come out, but it feels like there's a hole in the case right there. Maybe some kind of a wire went through that, I don't know. Taking a closer look at the APC, we have a black painted bezel around the internal built-in screen. I don't know what color the phosphor is on this. The two eight inch disc drives, you just squeeze this and that releases the mechanism. With the A and the B drive, there are actually two LEDs that are just visible through this smoked plastic. Not sure what the difference is between the two. Maybe one's a right protect LED. We have the NEC APC badge, which is metal. There is the power switch right here, which appears to be broken off. I don't think I actually noticed that. Now, one oddity is the power cord is right here and it's actually fixed to the front of the machine. It comes out of the case right there and it doesn't detach. Why they do that, I don't know. Over on this side, we have a brightness knob and then we have a volume knob along with these uh, little openings here. Perhaps this is for a speaker that's right inside the machine. I'm taking a look inside the power switch there. I'm gonna say there's no chance 
of me being able to do something to get this machine to work other than opening it up and removing the power supply. I could see what looks like a resistor there. So I'm assuming that maybe there was a little neon light in sort of some kind of a clear power switch or toggle switch that glowed when the machine, when the machine was on. But yeah, it looks like there's a couple contacts in there. So that would be mains live in there if I stuck something in there like my finger while this thing was actually plugged in. Here's the keyboard connection that goes into the back of the machine and has a ground strap as well. Here we are looking at the right side of the machine, but the left side looks exactly the same. There's pretty much nothing going on on it. It's just sort of a flat slab, but it gives you an idea of the uh, profile. There's a slight downward slant to the top of the machine. And you can see here, there's a little bit of a corner missing. So I'm assuming this machine was either dropped or impacted at some point that broke this little corner off, but the rest of the case is actually in decent shape. I do want to add though that this is black paint that's around the screen here and this was actually very scratched up and I've had this machine for a good number of months and when it was sitting here and I was kind of bored I took a sharpie and I just sort of dabbed on the scratched plastic which was showing this uh, yellowy beige behind, <laughs> behind it and it doesn't look too bad. I mean I can definitely see where I've touched it up but the yellow glaring scratches and marks were so distracting that this uh, Sharpieified black looks a lot better than it did. What's cool is these little levers here for the eight inch disc drives have this plastic here on the case that protects these from getting damaged. So that's a little nice extra feature. On the back of the machine, there's not a lot to report. It's just a big blank slab. Uh, there probably is some kind of a cover that goes here that's missing on this machine, but that would allow you to pop it off, plug in your connections and then cover this back up when you're done because the cables actually feed in through the bottom here. I know you can't really see it, but it feeds right up there. There's maybe like an inch and a half of space, and that allows you to easily connect, connect your cables. This is the keyboard connection right there. These are the ground connections. And then I'm assuming what printer and modem, something like that, although they look to be the same number of pins. So maybe you can hook up two printers or an external disk drive, or yeah, I don't really know. Over here on the bottom right, we have the APC-H02 Dual Disc Monochrome APC, made by NEC and made in Japan. Sort of implies that maybe they made a color version of this thing. Moving to the left, we have the regular FCC compliance badge. And then we have this badge here, which says the machine was manufactured in March 1983. And it says the chassis family is TU-001. Now for removing the top cover on this thing, it's actually pretty easy. There are little levers down here. It's not gonna be too easy to show, but there's a little metal lever right there and there's a similar one on the other side. So you simply put your hands underneath, flip those, and then you lift up on the case. And I did it on one side only. And there it is, the cover just pops off. With the top removed, we can see the design here. So this has two cards installed and I'm looking down, it looks like it has up to five cards that you can slide into this chassis here. These are the two eight inch disc drives, half height. And I think unlike the ones I've showed before on the channel, the spindle motor, I think is 24 volts on these. So it does not require a mains voltage to run these. There's this San Ace fan right here. And unlike the stuff we buy these days, this thing runs 115 volts. But even more wild is that this case, this, this surround to the blades, is actually die cast metal. And let's see about the blades on the fan. No, those are actually plastic. But yeah, this entire structure, including what's holding the motor here is all metal. And I just wanted to show this is the top cover lever. So this is what you're flipping when you're trying to remove the top. So you push the little lever towards the front of the computer when you're down on the bottom here, which moves, of course, this top part towards the back and then the top cover comes off. I'm just marveling at this disk drive here, all sorts of nice looking packages, this uh, ceramic gold package and another ceramic gold package there. I am seeing lots of tantalums on here though. So there is a possibility of short circuit on these just because of those tantalums. And this is in the perfect age range to short. Now, right down in here is the CRT. And of course it's an NEC branded picture tube there. And to be honest, there's a transformer right here. I wouldn't be surprised if this CRT actually runs right off mains voltage. Now, when it comes to power supply, I can see a little bit of it down there underneath the CRT chassis. So I think the CRT is gonna have to come out. And it looks like maybe this comes out in his entire module. I just need to remove this bracket here 
and potentially four screws, and then I can lift that thing out of there because I need to get that thing out of there, A, to check for refuzz, but B, I need to get that power switch out of there and, and repair it. While we're here, why don't we take a look at these cards here? So this one would be the floppy drive connection right there, and we already said that this is the monitor connection. And this connection here goes between, well, it looks like it goes to something on the back panel there. So maybe a printer or modem port. The cable is labeled and it says M slash D. And this one here, which also goes to the back, it's on this other card, ODA. Not very clear though about what those are. So let's see if we can pop these out of here. Oh, there's another connection right here. A couple connections. There it is. Pretty large card. Now, NEC, like a lot of Japanese companies, basically makes everything. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there's a ton of NEC chips on here. And okay, while there are NEC chips on here, like that and these packages, all these other ones are TI. Motorola. Seems like Texas Instrument made the majority of the 74LS logic that's on here. There's a PAL chip there. There's a missing socket. We have an EEPROM with a little bit of a clear capped on tape on it. This is a 27... 64. There's a whole bunch of static RAM right here. It's a 6116, which I think is 2K by 8 static RAMs. This right here is the NEC 765AC. That's the floppy drive controller. It's very common used on all sorts of things. This one here, though, is the NEC D72200-1. Unfamiliar with that particular package. And this up here is NEC 3251AC. Also unsure of what that is. We have a couple jumpers there. There's an unpopulated header. And what else is there to say about this? Not much. Other than the connectors on the back are very high quality. And it's very nice that it has these uh, little things to pull it out. And good quality gold contacts there. And that one's just for structural, structural rigidity. This one here is for signaling, obviously. All right, let's take out the next one, which is obviously going to be the CPU card. So, and whatever that is, the ODA port. And this one here is KB. Well, we know what that is. That's the keyboard connector. And then there's a little two pin jobby here. Oh, and I can tell this, look at this. Uh, let me pull this out of here. This seems to go to a clock battery. How nice that the clock battery is actually installed off to the side and not actually on the board where it would leak and destroy it all. All right, so as I said, this is the CPU card here. So we have the NEC 8086 there, and then we have an 8255, so that's like a well, I can't remember what these are. Like, you know, there's gonna be interrupt controller, a DMA controller, probably 8237. Here's another static RAM, another static RAM. Here we have 8259, 8259, we have two of those, 8250. So we have timer counter chips, stuff like that. Basically all these chips are gonna be on the IBM PC as well. But what makes this thing potentially not PC compatible is that these things are addressed in different ways. Now, I'm not exactly sure if this thing is sort of PC compatible or is completely not PC compatible. But just because it runs MS-DOS doesn't mean that the memory layout is the same or anything else is the same. That stuff is totally arbitrary and most IBM PC compatible machines just copied the way IBM did it. The companies making these things didn't need to do it that way. Now, one thing I haven't pointed out is the RAM. Like, where's the RAM on this? Now, we have some static RAM there and there were some on the other board. But there is DRAM right here. And this is 4164 chips. So basically, eight of these is 64K. So at the minimum, we have 128K of RAM right here, plus two parity RAM chips. So there is parity memory on here. But I'm just giving a quick look to see if I see any other RAM chips, and I am not. So it's really just 128K of RAM down here. So how advanced is that for a business machine? I suppose at the time, well, you know, that wasn't that bad. I and mean, if you think about the original IBM PC, it came out with 64K as its lowest option, and then later there was a 256K version and stuff like that. So the fact that this thing's only 128K is, is not completely unheard of. I'm just quickly checking to see if there's any DRAM on here, and no, there's, there's no other DRAM. So the only DRAM that exists is on the CPU card, and that's that 128K. All right, so I wanna take out this battery that I see on the side here. It's in a little holder that should slide out. Oh, it's very stuck in here. So we'll just take it off entirely. So there it is, it's a Sanyo non-rechargeable lithium battery, just three volts. And as you can see, it hasn't leaked. And the good thing is, is I can just replace this with a 2032, which will be easy and very plentiful.
All right, so looking down here, you can see there's a large connector. Hopefully that comes across in the camera. That's the power connector that goes to the back plane. So as I said, under the monitor chassis is the power supply. So we need to get this out of here so I can get to that power supply. Well, this computer has a little bit of a musty smell to it, but it doesn't seem to be particularly corroded inside. So that's a good thing. Thinking that these four screws that are on the chassis here, well, at least I can see three of them, I think hold the whole CRT chassis on as a whole. Okay, is this thing free? Yes, it is. Look at that, sliding around. So first thing to do is get this ribbon cable up and over. And it actually looks like there's a cable that goes to the front. It must be for the brightness control. So I'm gonna just slide this entire edge connector off of here. And there it is. This is the cable that goes, I think, to the front. And then it appears that there is a large connector here. So I think with that, this is actually good to go to come out. Let me figure out how to do that. I guess the question is, can I get the CRT out while the card cage is in? And I don't think that I can. Or maybe I can if I turn it all this way. Let's get this out of here. I think that did the trick. Just have to be very careful not to hit things. Okay, looks like there's a metal cover on the bottom. Just flip that around. All right, there is the power supply in all of its glory. So a large like heat sink there. This is that broken power switch right there. So the power connector does actually come out of the front of the computer. I unclipped it there. You see I'm moving it. So that means maybe I can find another power switch that fits in this hole and I just need to reconnect these connections here. Let me see if I can get those off. Oh yeah, look at that, it came off. It actually came off. So indeed, there it was a lighted power switch. There it is, and that's because I actually had a neutral connection and a live connection. That's for the front LED there. So there we have it, that is the power switch. It's just the normal push-in type. I'm sure I don't have a lighted one that's gonna work in place of this, but maybe I can find one that is at least, uh, well, not lighted and that will work in the hole. Well, take a look at this. I just went in my spare parts bin. I found this. I wanna be surprised if this one works. <laughs> it's got the same connections. I think it's the same size. Let me try. All right, first test. Does this actually fit in here? Oh, it does. Wow. That's it, it's in there. Total perfect fit, a <laughs> freaking replacement that I just had. And it's, well, it should work perfectly. All right, now when it comes to reefas or like the little uh, safety caps, looks like there's just the polyester type on here. So that's nothing that's gonna, uh, you know, let the smoke out like reefas do. So here's the CRT, nothing much to report. It's got a little soot and dirt on there. So this thing is definitely been used. There's the info right there. It's actually a Sanyo monitor, DC7712NX1. Is that the same one that the Model 2 uses? That, it's not exactly the same, but it might be similar. Hmm, interesting. All right, let's figure out how I got this in or out. Oh, let me clean the glass first. It's got a little soot on there. All right, let's pop this back in. <laughs> Remember what I did. I think it was like this. There we go. That goes back in without too much trouble. And of course, while it was out, I took the opportunity to clean the glass because uh, the parts behind the bezel, you can't clean otherwise. And that's all the schmutz that came off. All righty, let's take a quick break and let's try to learn about this machine a little by looking at what we can find online. Starting with Wikipedia here, we're on the APC series article and right away it says this that the article has multiple issues. Perhaps I will discover some truths about this machine uh, in this video series and we can go and update this page. So right off the bat, it says that the NEC APC, which is the machine that I have behind me, is part of the Japanese N5200 series, which is an 8086 based machine released in 1981. And it also uses the NEC 7220 high performance graphics display controller IC. It says here that the Japanese-only PC9800 series was derived from the N200, which is also the same as this NEC APC. 
It looks like NEC had an APC-2 and a 3 model that were based on the same architecture as this machine, but then the APC-4 was just IBM PC-AT compatible. I guess they threw in the towel, so to speak. So for the APC itself, it was released in 1982 for $3,300, and we can compare that to the IBM PC-5150, which was released in August 1981 and starting at $1,565. Keep in mind, though, that was without any floppy drives and no monitor, and maybe not even a keyboard, actually. Consider that the APC has the monitor, the keyboard, and also the disk drive. I think one disk drive was the minimum configuration included right out of the box, so it probably was somewhat price competitive. Now, you can see that a single floppy monochrome system was the base configuration, so this is a slightly higher than base one with dual floppy drives, but still the monochrome monitor, and there was a dual floppy color system for $5,000. Some interesting tidbits, at least according to this article, that this machine has versus the IBM PC is there's an entire 4 kilobytes of battery-backed-up RAM. There's a built-in clock calendar chip, and it also includes a parallel and a serial interface. And then the double-sided 8-inch disk drives in there support, at least according to this, a 1 megabyte disk. Keep in mind that the original 5150 with the floppy drive had a single-sided drive, so it was only 180K, and then later when the double-sided drive came out, it was 360K. So this thing really trumps that with the 1 megabyte of capacity on one floppy disk. Moving on to the built-in screen in this thing, we have a 12-inch monochrome or an 8-color display driven by that aforementioned NEC 7220 display processor. It can display 80 by 25 lines of characters with an additional line at the top of the screen for status bar. And each character is displayed in an 8 by 19 dot cell, giving a resolution of 640 by 475. That's a pretty high resolution for machines at this time. That's especially high resolution compared to CGA, but even more than monochrome, which had 350 lines. It looks like it had 250 predefined characters or 256 user-definable characters as well. Now, it looked like you had an optional graphics card which added a second graphics display processor with up to 512K of memory that overlaid the text on top of the graphics. That sounds pretty fantastic, and if it's anything like the PC9800, 8-color display is going to be very vibrant and nice and a lot better than CGA. In addition, that 7220 graphics processor allowed hardware scrolling and zooming and independent scrolling of different areas of screen, all things that the CGA and, of course, the monochrome interface on the PC could not do. All right, so let's just go right to the source of proper information for the APC, and let's go to NEC's own system reference guide, which is basically the service manual for this computer. It was easy to find with Google, and it's available on bitsavers.org if you're interested in looking at it yourself. Let's take a look at the overview here. It's everything we knew this thing had, so it's color or monochrome, but several options and accessories are available to enhance the performance or adapt your APC to special, special applications. All right, so here's the block diagram for the machine. And right off the bat at the bottom here, what's intriguing is it has 15 interrupts, which is something that only came to the IBM with the IBM PC AT where IBM actually took two interrupt controllers and cascaded them together, cascading IRQ2 on the first controller to actually connect or daisy chain, essentially, a second controller in. We have a block diagram here, so we have the two different cards. This is a processor card, so a system clock of just under 5 megahertz, so a little bit faster than the IBM PCAT. We have the microprocessor, we have the DRAM 128K, battery backed up calendar and clock control. We have the timer chips, there's probably a couple of those. ROMs, AK, 4K of battery backed up RAM. We saw that in the Wikipedia article. And that's interesting because that's a decent amount of battery backed up RAM, a lot more than even later PCATs got, where the CMOS for the BIOS settings was, I don't even know how big it was, but you know, we're talking 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 bytes, 128 bytes, something like that. Definitely not 4K like this. We also have four channels of DMA available, which I think is the same as what's on the original PCXT or 5150. Moving on to the other board in the system, we have the 7220 CRT display processor. So we saw that, plus that uh, SRAM that was on there that's for like the display buffer, plus those redefinable fonts. We have the floppy drive controller, which is that NEC 765IC. There is the alarm and music sound programming IC, the NEC 1771. We'll have to read more about that, hopefully, in this document. That's interesting. 
And then take a look at this, the arithmetic processing unit, 8231, optional. Oh, wow, that's uh, kind of intriguing. So it doesn't use a normal 8087. This uses something that maybe NEC designed, or I don't know, 8231, that sounds like an Intel part number. While editing, I went and looked up the 8231, and yeah, it's an Intel chip, and it's pretty interesting, actually. It was designed for the original 8080, but it wasn't tightly coupled to the processor like the 8087 was, which meant that this could be used on all sorts of other processors, including a card for the Apple II and II Plus that used this exact chip. How fascinating is that? I have no idea why NEC decided to use this as opposed to the 8087. The article here states that prior to the introduction of the 8087, Intel's own data sheet suggested the use of this chip. We have the floppy drives, and then there are additional cards here, the graphics adapter, so that's that second board that has the graphics capability that seems to interface to the main graphics processor to overlay the text and graphics on top of each other. We have additional optional memory expansions, and we have alternate I.O. controllers. And then here it mentions that there are 250 built-in characters plus 256 redefinable characters. Pretty advanced stuff. Hercules allowed for redefinable characters, if I recall, but only until EGA were you able to redefine characters on an actual IBM adapter. So EGA, VGA, and everything after that supported redefinable fonts. Here's a little bit more about this alarm and music sound processing system that's different than just the beep speaker on the regular PC. It enables you to select alarm tones and generate music across two octaves with selected tempos, volumes, and tone characteristics. Definitely way more advanced than what's on the regular PC. The power supply in the unit looks like it's about 100 watts. And look at this. The power supply has software controlled power off circuit that enables you to turn off the system locally or remotely. How neat is that? That's like ATX standard had that. Macintosh added that in like the late 80s on the Mac 2. This thing had it all the way back in 1982. Right here, it talks about how the APC comes with 128K of RAM, which is what we saw on the processor card, and it is able to be expanded all the way up to 640K. That implies that the memory map is somewhat similar, at least in, in the basic sense, to the regular IBM PC. Documentation so far is actually really quite nice. It has all the pinouts here of the edge connectors inside the backplane in the system. There's timing diagrams. It looks like the four DMA channels in the system are configured like this. The display controller takes up channel zero, floppy drive on channel one, reserved for graphic options. So I guess the graphics board uses channel two, and channel three is available for future use. And here we go. It's talking about the 8259 interrupt controllers. And it says here that it looks like IRQ7 is the cascade interrupt that goes from the first controller over to the second one. That's very much unlike the PC where it's IRQ2, which cascades down to the second controller. In fact, take a look at this. Here's the list of all the supported IRQs. The COM port is IRQ1, and the timer is on IRQ3 with the keyboard on IRQ4. Printer IRQ7, CRT or video controller on IRQ10, and 11 is the floppy drive controller. And then APU, whatever that is, is on uh, 14. These are completely different than the regular PC. Basically, what we're learning here is that things like the interrupt being totally different and the fact that this uses a, that 7220 graphics processor means that any software that's written for the regular IBM PC that talks directly to the hardware is not going to work on this system. The system is similar in that, you know, the memory map seems to be 0 to 640K, but the fact that these peripherals are completely different mean that it's very, very unlikely any software is going to work unless it was coded just using DOS calls, like DOS 2.1 calls, which I think is the OS that runs on this. Anything that goes directly to hardware has to be either custom written for this machine or it's just not going to work. Ah, okay, here we go. This is the actual memory map for the system. And it looks like just like on a regular PC, memory starts at the beginning of the address space, 128K. And looks like expanded RAM, there we go, can go all the way up to 8,000, well, one byte less than that, for 640K. And then we have the first 4K of battery backed up RAM starts at 8,000. Well, I am saying 8,000, but it's actually A0000. That's just the way the address space works on the Intel 8086 and 8088. 
Looks like the battery backed up RAM is duplicated over and over again, all the way up to C1000. I suppose they thought that you might have 128K of battery backed up RAM, even though only 4K is installed, that select logic actually selects all 128K. So a little mod might be to actually switch the 4K out with 128K of SRAM and then have a battery to run that thing when the system is off. And you'd have yourself a little high RAM, RAM disk OS kind of thing that maybe, I don't know if the ROM supports this, but it'd be kind of cool if it could like boot to that 128K RAM disk and basically be instant on. And then here at C1000, we have the alphanumeric ROM, uh, whatever that means. I assume that's like the character ROMs, not used. Oh yeah, it says display memory right here. And then here at E1000 is the redefinable character RAM, so you can make your own character set. So Petsky, anyone? <laughs> yeah, totally possible on this system. And then F1000 and up appears to be all ROM space. Now, it only has 8K of ROM on the board, which means that it's duplicated over and over again. That's because the chip select logic, it just keeps selecting that ROM over and over again if you, add, if you access any part of that. The reason why it's all the way over the top is because when you turn on the system, the kind of interrupt vector or the reset vector on the 8086 goes to the top of memory there and it starts executing code. So that's why the ROM needs to be up there. But this system could therefore be expanded to have what, like 64K of ROM, a nice improvement over that built-in 8K. So they left themselves like some expandability here with this memory map uh, that looks like the way this is designed. Now, one thing I'm noticing is like, doesn't seem like video memory is actually mapped into anywhere in the address space here. So that means probably have to go through that display processor chip, like talk to it over IO ports to update to well, to read or write out of the video RAM. That's probably done because there's probably a bunch of acceleration capabilities there. We saw that the video display controller was using a DMA channel. So most likely there's a way that you can like bulk copy the DRAM into the video memory or vice versa by using DMA operations. Reading about main memory here, it says that 640K is supported, but only 256K is supported by present equipment. Probably means that you can buy additional RAM boards right now and the maximum configuration is additional second RAM board, giving you a total of 256K with that additional or with the onboard 128K. It looks like there's a write protect circuit for the battery backed up memory as well. So you can write to it and then probably set some kind of flag with an IO port to be sure that you won't accidentally erase that memory. Let's check out the specs on the graphics to see how accurate the Wikipedia article was. So we have 80 by 25 with a 26th line reserved for status information, 8 by 19 character box with a 7 by 11 dot character. So that's the font size. And then you have an 8 by 16 dot programmable character. And take a look at this. The monochrome display employs a yellow green long persistence phosphor P39. And it says that it does have 475 lines of vertical resolution, 640 by 475. And then the horizontal drive is 22.7 kilohertz. So that is more akin to what you're getting on the monochrome display adapter on the PC more than the 15.7 kilohertz you get on CGA. And then the vertical refresh rate is 41.5 hertz. Wow, that's really, really low. So that would be why there's long persistence phosphor. Otherwise you'd have really terrible flicker. And the color version of this system must also use a long persistence phosphor for color display, which is definitely on the more unusual side. Otherwise you'll have terrible flicker with 41 hertz. Even monochrome on the IBM PC is 50 hertz. And on some monitors, that flickers a little bit because they're not using long persistence phosphor. On the actual IBM 5151, which is the green monochrome monitor that IBM made, that absolutely does use long persistence phosphor. So you get a nice stable, no flicker image on it. And looking up the block diagram here, it's kind of what I suspected earlier. So there's the 8086 data bus. We have the graphics processor and then the attribute memory. So the character memory and the attribute memory is on the other side of the graphics display processor. So this is unlike CGA and monochrome or MDA, where the, even though you have like the 6845 chip, the video RAM is directly in the address space of the processor. So you can write and read directly from that RAM that might be on your CGA or MDA card, which is one of the ways that programs, well, it's primarily the way that most programs update to screen memory because it's really fast compared to going through the BIOS or the DOS calls. And here, just as I suspected, there's the layout of the graphics control processor, the CRT unit, which has its own power supply, as I saw, 
and then the brightness control knob which comes off the connector and goes to the front of the case. We have the pinout as well, so it's just a normal horizontal vertical drive and a video signal for the monochrome monitor. And here's the color one, just has some additional wires for RGB. One thing that is interesting is I'm pretty sure that the graphics display processor in this machine is the color one. It's the same one for both systems. They just have a different monitor module in there. I don't even know if there's any difference with the case. It might just be that self-contained chassis that you can take out and put a color one in if you get your hands on one. All right, I'm scrolling through stuff about the floppy drive controller. This looks all relatively run of the mill. All right, so this is kind of interesting. So this is showing the pinout here of the 50 pin connector on the floppy drive. And this looks totally different than what is used on the regular Sugar drives, even the 50 pin connector, like on the Model 3. The signaling is all the same. It's just the pinout is all different. That means that I can't easily just connect a GoTech to this thing because of this, these differences here. So the only way I think I can really hope to try to get files on and off of this thing is using an eight inch disk drive hooked up to a PC. And here we are talking about the serial port on here and it has that Centronics connector on the back. The thing is, even if I could make it a cable that goes to this, I don't have any software that runs on this thing that will allow me to transfer data on and off of the computer. So if that was like a way of using like X modem or Kermit to try to send files to this thing, like programs and stuff, not quite sure that's gonna work. If you have any ideas about how to get stuff on and off this machine, definitely comment down below because I did a little bit of Googling and I can't initially find any way to easily read and write the floppy disks that this thing makes. All right, here we are on the sound control chip on this, the 1771. Looks like it hooks directly up to the data bus, only eight bits, of course, and we have uh, IO select lines and it runs on a four megahertz clock. So this thing is kind of a little synthesizer chip all in of itself, far more complex than what's on the regular IBM. In fact, take a look at the sound commands here. We have music notes and beep notes, but it has volume settings and tempo settings, a legal setting, but a piano, a medium, and a forte sound for the volume. I mean, I don't know if that's just loud, medium, and soft, and illegal, I guess, doesn't work. But then if we look down here, there's actually attack settings and music expression settings. So it seems that this thing supports some kind of like synthesis where the notes don't just come on full blast and then stop. They can ramp up and down. And that, again, like I said, far more advanced than other sound chips at the time. All right, moving on, jumper settings for that same card. And take a look, there it is. There's a jumper setting to switch between monochrome and color. So I could probably hook up the RGB to HDMI to this thing and get some color output visible. I wouldn't be able to see it on that screen, obviously, but uh, I could set up a profile to view it on the RGB to HDMI. Thing is, I don't know if I have any software even that generates color because the discs that came with this thing are for this thing, which of course only has a monochrome screen. So yeah, that's probably not gonna work, but it's just an option if you are able to get your hands on a color display module to replace the monochrome one, then you can just flip the jumper here and get it to work. Well, here's something that's really cool. So I think I pointed out looking at the PCBs in there, there are a couple PAL chips that are in use and it outlines what they are right here. And take a look at this. All the equations are here as well. That means that any of these chips die, I think they could all be replicated with these equations that are here. Someone would just have to type these in and generate those JED files to make new PAL chips. That is freaking awesome. I really don't understand why other companies didn't publish this information. And like on the original Apple Macintosh motherboards, there are PAL chips that are used. And if those die, you're basically gonna have to take one off of another Mac, because as far as I'm aware, no one has reverse engineered those chips up until this point. But NEC, they just provide you with the equations here. That is freaking awesome. And what is nice is they also include all the schematics for the entire computer. So that is very helpful because if any repairs are needed, this is gonna go a long way to making that much be much easier. Uh, one thing I'm noticing right here, and I don't think anything mentioned this, is it appears that this is a true 16-bit system. So 41, 64, these are the DRAM chips. 
It looks like they are laid out where all 16 are used. There's no 8-bit shenanigans like on the IBM PC XT. Obviously, we're using a real 8086 here, but you could still hook that up in a way that uses 8-bit peripherals. Now, I think some of the peripherals in here are hooked up that way, but it looks like the DRAM is definitely hooked up at a full 16-bit of width. But take a look at this, though. This is a 7220, the graphics processor, and it is only hooked up through 8 bits. So this does not have the advantage of 16 bits. Perhaps this chip was designed for use on, like, a Z80 or some other 8-bit processor. Okay, I think we've done enough looking at these documents here. The system is kind of cool. It's got some very interesting features. Why don't we try to get the system running? I think before I totally put this thing back together, I'm just going to loosely plug the boards in here just so we can see if it works because if I have to get back to that power supply, I don't, no point to put the CRT screws back in, right? Let's put in this, the CPU board first. And then next up, the graphics board. Okay, I'm gonna keep the camera pointed down here in case any smoke comes out. I'm gonna plug this in. I have it set to off on the front, although it's a different power switch, so I'm not 100% sure if that works in exactly the same way. And in fact, because this thing might go boom or something, I'm gonna plug this into, well, directly into the mains, not into my UPS, because if, uh, you know, it goes short circuit, I don't wanna cause a little bit of a blackout on all my things that are on the UPS. So I'm gonna plug it in over here. Here we go. Okay, nothing happened, which is good because it should be off. Now I'm going to come around to the front and I'm going to turn on the switch. Here we go. All right. There's a light on the uh, power board there on the CPU board. The fan's running, but that's just 120 volts. So that, of course, should work. All right. And would you look at that? We actually have something on the screen. That looks awesome. We see some of the retrace lines. That's interesting. But there is an asterisk there in the corner. Let's see about this brightness control. All right, it's pretty dim, I gotta say. I mean, if I turn that all the way up, of course this thing may be worn out, but I might need to make a little tweak to the cathode drive on the CRT to brighten that up, kind of like I did recently on the Model 4P. All right, so there was no beep. Well, maybe the volume is down, actually. Let's see, that's up. So if I turn the volume up, uh, let's turn the power off. One thing is the power light on the switch is not lighted, but that could be because the neon light in there is gone. I don't remember where I got this switch from. Turned it back on. Yeah, there's no light on the power switch, so oh well. Yep, we just get that asterisk up here with uh, two square brackets. No beep, no attempt to boot or anything. Let me plug the keyboard in. That fan, it's quite noisy. It looks like it has a normal power cord, which is kind of interesting. I can unplug the fan there, take the power cord off. All right, same thing. We're just stuck there at the uh, startup screen there. So when we turn it back on, we'll just place the keyboard here. The cable of the keyboard just comes right out of the side. All right, what happens if we push some keys on the keyboard? Seems like nothing. Well, let me grab one of these discs here. This says CPM86 Operating System Original. I'm going to say that the discs go in with the label facing the screen because uh, the spindle motor... Oh, it's spinning. Oh, hey, look at that! Double LED action. Oh, hello. It's very loud. Wow, that's clankety clank. All right, there we have it. So it's CPM 86 1.1. It shows the date up here with no year because, of course, I removed that clock battery. Well, there is no clock battery, right? And uh, country select Australia, France, Germany. Let's do nine for the US. Oh, the keyboard is working. That is good to know. Wow, that is a noisy disk drive. Clankety clank. Oh, hey, I also just noticed that the power uh, switch is now lit. I am telling you that it wasn't earlier. As is normal for eight inch disk drives, the disk is spinning while the disk is in there. And I guess that's what the bottom LED is to indicate that it is actually running. Top one is that it's accessing. So if we type DIR, there it goes. Look at that. We're running CPM 86. All right. And with that, I'm going to end this video here. I wanted to just check this machine out and see if it worked, which, as you can see, this thing fully functions, which is really exciting because everything on the ba in the basement lately has been very broken. So it was a real pleasure, I guess, to have a machine that was easy to work on, A, 
B, it just worked other than that power switch, which wasn't the fault of the computer. That was obviously a physical impact or something like that. And it's just cool to see this thing working. Incidentally, I did type on all the keys on the keyboard and every single key switch on this thing does work at well, as well, which is a real pleasure compared to the foam and foil junk that I've been working with a lot lately, which of course doesn't work at all unless, you know, you replace everything. So I hope you've enjoyed a little look at this machine and learning a little bit about it. I know I did. It's cool to see stuff like this that is not really PC compatible and yet could be if the design choices made by the designers were to make it PC compatible. But this thing was blazing its own trail as NEC did and the Japanese computers that this thing is based off of. So that's pretty cool. I think from my understanding, they targeted this really as like a higher end business computer versus the IBM PC, which even though it came out of IBM, I think it was, you know, geared a little bit more to the home users and office users. But the fact is this thing has some serious business applications with like large capacity disks and stuff that the regular IBM PC didn't have. In the next part, I would literally like to try out some other software on this thing. Obviously, CPM86 stuff should work pretty well because that stuff generally doesn't write directly to hardware. It always goes through the CPM BIOS. So if I can figure out how to get that stuff onto the disks here, then I should be good. MS-DOS, on the other hand, I'd like to try out MS-DOS software on here. Some of it should work. If it was designed to work with MS-DOS 211 on the PC and it doesn't use any hardware calls, well, then it should work. I guess the other problem is though, is it might use BIOS calls and this thing has a different BIOS, doesn't have the IBM PC BIOS. So it really has to be stuff that only uses MS-DOS calls. How much of that software actually exists? I don't really know. So if you have any ideas about stuff that might work on this, definitely put a comment down below. I also need to know if anyone has any ideas of how to get stuff on and off of this. I'm hoping that the disk format that MS-DOS uses is just normal FAT. And if I hook up eight inch disk drive to a PC, maybe I can read and write the floppy disks that are for this thing. And that will be obviously the easiest way of getting the data onto this machine. My only problem is I'm not sure I have any other double-sided drives to hook up to a DOS PC, but this thing says it should read single-sided disks. So I guess we'll find out about that. We do know after reading the Techco manual that the various hardware subsystems in this are so different than what's on an IBM PC. Anything that really tries to talk directly to the hardware is just not going to work unless it was actually designed for this computer. And I think there was a library of software that existed for this, both in CPM and in DOS. So if anyone has any pointers to where I might be able to find some of that, that would be pretty fun and pretty cool to try as well. So that is going to be it for now. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at this machine on the inside and the out, as I know I did. It's just a really cool machine to work on and it feels very, very well made other than the yellow color of this thing. But yeah, I just, I'm really intrigued by it. Just love that long persistence phosphor too. It just it looks so cool. Anyhow, if you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't you know what to do? All that youtube -y stuff, comment down below, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And I guess that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.